Faircast had a very promising beginning in the sense that it started as a university project, got a lot of uh, press attention before we even had anything. Financing happened like that. We were incubated in Madrona's basement, which I always like to call their daylight basement because it's on the 36th floor. <laughs> I hired two guys who are just incredibly, incredibly talented technical guys I'd worked with before. So before you knew it, there were four of us. Uh, we had a plan. Everything, everything was going great. And then um, our key data miner they said, you know, this is not working. This is not going to work. The CEO said, look, this is not going to work. I quit. This was, I don't know, uh, two, three months into to the company. Matt McElwain, who's the you know, board member, you know, finance says to me, Warren, I hear this is not going to work. What, <laughs> what, what do you think? <laughs> and, and the thing is, this is the key thing. First, I tell him how great Bob is, yeah. right, the technical guy. And you meet Bob, and you have instant credibility, right? He says it's not going to work. It's not going to work. <laughs> and this isn't like something you, you know, you'd want to hide from your investors, but there's no hiding it. It's in the basement. He's working next door to Matt. He stops by. He says, Matt, it's not going to work. He goes, I quit. Right? So now we used to be four dream team. Now we're down to two. And we just got the most ringing indictment. So Matt's a friend. He's looking at me. He says, Orrin, what do you think? I said to him, you know, Matt, yeah, we could, we could shut it down. I said, but I think it will work. Uh, I think you know th the problem with Bob is he's such a straight shooter he can't see around corners and sometimes you have to yes there's a technical challenge here but we're going to solve it and you know Matt to his credit says okay solve it <laughs> and you know professor not professor CEO not CEO the burden of that right. solve it you know I feel it on my shoulders in fact I still feel it right right here yeah. and so I got together with VP of engineering he's completely unfazed by this he's like. Don't worry, Aaron. we'll figure this out. That's awesome. And you know, make a long story short, we figured it out. Yeah. And from there, we grew and grew. And plenty of challenges and up and down, right? It could fill uh, many dinners with it. But the key thing is the mechanism, our ability to predict prices did work. You know, my first, first company, um, we actually built it on academic research. So it was, it was a brilliant idea, I thought, at, at first. You know, that the simple idea was, as you're going through a website, we could predict whether or not you're gonna end up buying on the website or not, just based on what pages you visited on. And so the brilliant idea was, hey, if we know whether or not you're gonna buy, we could probably influence it and increase the chances that you're gonna buy by giving you a discount or giving you free shipping or some sort of incentive if we know it's highly likely you're just gonna walk away and catch it before you walk away. And so we took this idea and we talked to a bunch of retailers and we said, hey, if we built this thing, will you buy it? And everybody said, yes, yes, I will definitely buy this product. So go ahead and build it. So we built it, and uh, we actually uh, prove it out in some case studies that it worked. And then we're like, OK, well, it's time for us to uh, collect on our revenues. You know? So let's, uh, let's, let's have you pay up. And uh, not one company paid up for the service. At that point, you know, I've taken about 1.2 million bucks, kind of brought it down to you know, $200. And uh, the employees that we had on board, we said, hey, we're going to cut you a check, but don't cash it just yet. You know, it's, you know, just wait. You know, it may, it may, may cash eventually. And so that for us was basically uh, kind of the, you know, either call it quits or keep going. Uh, and if you do keep going, you're kind of crazy because there's literally no money. We decided at that point to actually pivot the company to take the technology and say, hey, you know what? We're going to dumb down the product. So we're not going to do all this fancy algorithm of figuring out how to ship out products. We're just going to take the part where we're like tracking people through the website and turn that into a business. So we decided to uh, build what we call microanalytics, allow people to actually track how you're using your mouse and how you're scrolling, how you're fast you're typing and so forth, and figure out where people are getting stuck. And then telling the retailer, hey, here's how you might want to improve your products so that you're able to and get higher conversion rates. And what I did was um, started going to Barnes & Noble and picking up books on how to cold call. And so <laughs> I, I learned how to, how to actually sell products. Awesome. And so all the phone calls that were coming in to the office were creditors asking for money. 
that was really bad on the emotional psyche. So I unplugged that so there's no calls I could come in because I couldn't pay them anyway. And it just made outbound calls and started making, making progress selling product. Once we were able to start selling product, uh, $10,000 product, $20,000 product, $100,000 product, we were starting to see real revenues, real profits, and then eventually able to exit. But again, it was one of those very, very, very close calls in terms of trying to make the, the business work, but eventually made the right pivot. Well, I guess I could tell the story about how my second company failed and how I remember sitting at that boardroom telling everybody they had to go home and give up. But I'm going to tell a different story because that's the end of that one. <laughs> oh, man. It's a short story because that one failed. That one never came back. That one. <laughs> that one never came back from no the No twist, huh? Prior to doing all my startups, um, I was a professional sailor. And when I was a kid, I had this sort of dream of sailing around the world. There was a race around the world. So I did a bunch of things, and I ultimately got on this boat that was going to do the around the world race in 93, 94. And that race was divi divided into six legs, and it was a cumulative uh, sort of points race. So, you know, six different legs, whoever had the best scores across those legs won. We go into the fifth leg with kind of an insurmountable lead. And we're sailing up the coast of Brazil and the mast falls down. Oh, oh wow, man. So effectively at that point in time, the race is over. Because, you know, even if you're well ahead, like you're now way behind, you're going to get last in that leg. So the first thing you think is, okay, save the boat so we don't sink. Right. Okay, so life and limb, like yeah. everybody's safe. Yeah. The boat's not going to sink. Then the emotion is, it's over. Like this thing we all dreamed of doing, both sailing around the world, but also being successful at winning the race, is over like that. Like not closing it around to financing, like losing your big customer, like something. And it took us about three days from the time the mast fell down to the time we got to the coast of Brazil where we could sort of fix the boat. And that, that sort of time is everybody refactored what they thought success was. To your point, like we thought, wait, we have like all these people who have been supporting us all the way around to do this thing, to succeed in our goal. We can't let them down. So we kind of hit the land with vigor, fixed the boat, ultimately finished the fifth leg last by a week. But then we went on to win the last leg, you know, sail into England, having completed 32,000 miles sailing around the world. And I think most of us, you know, really consider that quite a big success, having not given up having refactored what, how we characterize success mm -hmm. and doing it for ourselves and for our investors and for everybody who was there. The early days of my first company, Ontella, uh, were full of hope and optimism. A friend and I were both working nights and weekends in my basement. I was spending every spare minute working on the business. And we finally locked in a presentation spot, spot for the Alliance of Angels at their December meeting. And I said, that's it. That's what I need. I'm going to quit my job and make this full time. We're going to raise financing around and do an angel round. We'll do a VC round you know, in a year or so, and we'll go make this happen. So I gave notice, quit my job, went and pitched the Alliance of Angels meeting. It was actually a great success. We had a ton of investor interest. We were really excited. And then everybody went on vacation. And not knowing any better, I was like, oh, people are away on vacation. I'll just, you know, in January, when everything gets back and everybody's back. And, you know, people New Year's. And so, you know, first, second week of January, start calling for follow-ups. And there was nothing. There's no energy. There was no inertia. There was just, oh, yeah, we kind of remember maybe some meeting. And nothing came of it. So I started basically full-time fundraising. I went to every networking event in the city. I called everybody who I'd ever met, which was zero VCs and one angel investor. <laughs> it took nine months from the time when I left till the first non-family check cleared. And then we had oversubscribed angel round, and a month later, six term sheets from VCs. When it changed, the luck changed like that. But in the month before that changed, it looked every bit as grim as it had the month before and the month before that and the month before that. It was the strangest thing, but we didn't know we were winning until we'd won. It's amazing, it's amazing in those days like how long people will stick with it, yeah. either because of you or because of the vision or because of both. 
and and it's like they're you're all stupid to keep doing it against all it's rational it's, it's, all of it. it's, it's like totally yeah, naive. Yeah. right you're like why are why are we all still here like it's been months and months and months that you've been paid like nothing and yet everybody's still there and then sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't right all right so i'm not i'm not going to talk about a specific company per se but i'm going to i'm going to talk about being an entrepreneur because i've never had anything come out of the ashes it just burnt to a crisp and that was it uh so January of 2000, I quit my job, which I'd been in for, not, for five months after college, to take all the money I earned while I was working in college and working this job and start a business. And the business was cross-site analytics. Basically, a spyware that you opted into that said, hey, we're going to track you, we'll anonymize the data, and we'll help other websites who use this data improve themselves. And, um, and it was a you know, fairly good idea, except I didn't know how to execute. I had no idea how to actually pull this off. I was not a developer. I didn't know what to do. And so the business failed for all the reasons why a business should fail. I made all, I, is, that, is that a bad reason? Check. And I just went down the list of like, adding bad reasons to one another. <laughs> and so one of the things that I did, which they warned me never to do, is put, your, put the company expenses on your personal credit card. So I ended up with $40,000 of credit card debt oh. and no, no income. <laughs> like, so we closed the company down and we gave everybody like whatever money was left in the bank and 9-11 happens. And this was like the recession and 9-11 happens and like I go into this deep depression and, I, and I've written about this where I'm basically contemplating suicide. I'm not like putting a gun to my head, but I'm like the only thing I can think about is how do I end this? This is not going to work out. How do I, how do I get out of the situation? And, and it seems like death seems like a pretty decent option at this point. But I find myself getting out. I, you know, I leave the house, I leave, I get back out there, and I work for a friend who was running an internet radio startup. And, and he's like, I don't have any money. <laughs> I'm also just as broke as you. Um, I can pay you $8.50 an hour to run my entire company. Will you join me? Sure. It's more than the zero dollars I was making. And the deal that I made with myself is I could go and try to get an MBA or I could work for other entrepreneurs and learn from them. If I go get an MBA, I'll have to pay money to go get an education. If I go work for other entrepreneurs who've been successful, then I get paid to make, to study. 8.50 an hour. Well, yeah. <laughs> Whatever it was, was more than I was gonna pay to an MBA school, right? So I ended up working for this guy who built this software company out in the suburbs, and I worked on him for three years. Um, I remember walking into his office one day, and he sits me down in front of the CFO, a very seasoned, well-respected CFO, and he turns to me and he, and he goes, Ben, I want you to be the next CEO of this company, and I'm going to put you on the fast track. And the CFO turns to him and goes, I thought you were going to make me the CEO. <laughs> this is weird, awkward conversation. Six months later, I'm coming home from a vacation. I get a message, email, all hands. Company's been sold. Right? And so I, I kind of work through the cycle of learning and experiencing life through pretty brutal lenses. And after two and a half years of that, I'm like, okay, I think I'm ready. I don't, I don't care what it is. I, I didn't know what a meme was. I didn't know what it, like, I, this whole cheeseburger thing was totally serendipity, being open to luck. And whatever it is, I'm ready to do it. And so that's why I'm here. It's sort of been trivialized failure. Yeah. yeah. And, and in the, oh, I raised all this money and I ran out of money and then I went back to Stanford and got an MBA or whatever. Right, like, right. That, that's not the same as, like, what I, I think I felt when the mask fell down or what I think I felt sitting around the table or what I think you felt, yeah. like when you really, really go to the mat yeah. to try and make something successful, yeah. Yeah. right? Like yeah. all the shit you go through in the future is like, well, it's not as bad as that. Right. Like this is nothing. But can I tell you something through all this, something that scares me so much about, uh, about the startup community, which is I see people all the time who are trusting in their vision, who are believing in the possibility, who are down to the last line of credit on the last credit card, and who are going to fail. And who because of these stories, and because of the survivorship bias, because they hear about the, the ones successes. who bounced, yep. Yep. not the ones who crashed, are going to drive their family into bankruptcy, yep. are going to take their company into the ground, and who really are not clearly not going to make it, but who don't get that message. Because for every person who tells them, look, here's the reason this isn't going to work. Here's the reason we're not buying. Here's the reason we're not investing. They just put and say, everybody, everybody you know, gets wrong. that message. Everybody's wrong. This happened to everybody. right? Like Everybody said Einstein was crazy, but 
they also said that about Bozo the Clown, right? And you only hear about Einstein. This is about investing in your friend's idea for a bar that serves oxygen carbonated drinks. This is about investing in your sister's dream of being a chef. It's about driving new entrepreneurship at a level that, and through a mechanism that's never been seen before.